it's Ingrid Jarrett, President and CEO of the BC Hotel Association. Uh, this recording and webinar will be recorded and it will be sent out in our communique following the presentation. It'll also be uh, housed on our BCHA website, bcha.com. So you're certainly welcome to share it uh, with your colleagues who may not have been able to join us this afternoon. We uh, ask that all of you uh, put your um, sound on mute and uh, use the chat function. What we will do is be going through a slide deck with our partners and co-presenters at the Insurance Bureau of Canada for commercial insurance. And uh, there is a chat function at the bottom of your screen. So you can go into that chat function and you can put any questions that you have during the presentation. We will do the presentation and then the last 15 minutes or so we will have a Q&A. You also have submitted questions to us prior to the webinar. So what we will do is uh, most of those questions are actually addressed during this slide deck in the webinar and anything following that isn't uh, an answer to that point, we're most uh, pleased to work through the chat and answer those questions <clears throat> that you may have. So thank you very much for joining us today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rob Dupree, who is Director of Consumer and Industry Relations with for Western Canada, and also Darius Delon, who is Risk Manager. I can tell you over the past uh, few months, really since July, we've had very, very challenging times in the insurance industry, both with our hospitality division and now with our hotel renewals. Um, certainly, I, I know that as we speak of hardening of the market and uh, increased premiums and a lack of competition from an underwriter perspective, none of this really provides us the answers we, we want, which is we wish our premiums were lower and that we weren't faced with this challenge at a time when we're also uh, challenged with the pandemic. So um, an unenviable position Rob and Darius both uh, have to hopefully uh, provide some education and background, but also some potential solutions that we, as your industry, industry advocate, along with the Insurance Bureau of Canada, potentially can ensure that we're working towards a different landscape in the future. So without further ado, Rob and Darius, may I ask you to uh, go ahead and uh, present. Sure, thank you, Ingrid, and, and thank you to the British Columbia Hotels Association for allowing us to come in and share some information with you. The Hotel Association has experienced some very significant challenges. We understand that. We've been hearing about it. They fall under the business insurance or the commercial insurance category, the three main categories being home, auto, and, and business or commercial insurance. We started seeing some challenging market conditions appear in late 2019. And some of these conditions have just been ongoing and some of them have been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. So my name is Rob Dupree and with me is Darius Delon and Darius is IBC's national risk manager. And he's actually working with a number of businesses and brokers across the country. We started doing some work with the Stratas in BC and there were some condos in Alberta as well that had some challenges. And we have a number of programs that are going on across the country and we'll get to those in a few moments here, but we just wanna share with you some information about commercial insurance. So Insurance Bureau of Canada, we're the National Industry Association for Canada's home, auto and business insurers. And our members represent about 90% of the Canadian property and casualty insurance market. So these are the companies that insure your home, your auto and your business. We're not the regulator. In British Columbia, it's the BC Financial Services Authority. That's actually the regulator and regulates the insurance industry. There was some discussion and, and we work very closely with the governments and with the regulators. And recently there was a report that came out from the regulator on the strata corporations because stratas were experiencing some very significant challenges earlier this year and continue to have these challenges. I'd like to share with you some information about the current state. So the current state, 
as you know from your businesses and your revenues, it's not very good. British Columbia just announced some additional restrictions that they were going to be essentially eliminating social gatherings for only immediate family members, but not for your extended family that's going to be extending into the new year, which is just exacerbating the already difficult conditions that the hotels already have in British Columbia and even across the country. Not very good to hear, but we're just going to share with you some information about things that are going on, work that we are doing, both as an industry and, and also with the regulator and the governments as well. So I wanna talk about a state of the commercial insurance industry. So there's been a number of factors that have led us to this point. And, and one of the biggest factors that we're seeing is just, we're seeing an overall increase of claims. So BC had some very significant wildfire activity over the last four or five years. In fact, a couple of years ago, they had the largest wildfire for the size that that province has ever seen. Although your business may not have been directly impacted by fire, it may have been impacted by some of the civil authority restrictions that weren't allowing people into certain communities, or you may have had some smoke damage to your property. There's also been quite a bit of flooding that's happened in BC as well. So all of the insurance risks are pooled together and the premiums of the many are paying for the losses of the few. The insurance industry does that to essentially spread out these risks as much as they can to try to keep the premiums stable. What we are seeing, however, is just an increased claims across the entire country. And they're not just property claims, they're also liability claims. These slip and falls or the liquor liability. There's one particular jurisdiction where they've had a lot of people that have been thrown out of of liquor establishments and bars and pubs, and then those people get injured and then they're going after the, the business owner. We're also seeing a lot of increased insurer losses. So the insurance companies have a lot of losses as well. There's two areas that the insurance industry has to gather up dollars to pay out those claims. They're from the premiums of the policy holder and that's called underwriting income. And there's also the investment income. So the return on equity, when you invest your money, you want it to grow. So because of those low interest rates that we've seen since the 20, 2009 financial crisis, very low interest rates and below average, that has an impact on the overall dollar amounts or those reserves of that capital to pay out on the claims. So really what we're seeing here is just increased rates as a result of those factors. Some other factors that we're also seeing is just severe weather. So between 1983 and 2008, the insurance industry on average, on an annual basis, paid out about $422 million in severe weather claims. That's across the country. Over this past decade, that number has increased to $1.9 billion annually on average. So that's a 350% increase in claims. Now this year in Alberta alone, they had a couple big events. They had a big hailstorm in central Alberta around the Calgary area and also some flooding in northern Alberta and, and a couple of other smaller storms. That amount has already surpassed $2 billion. So we're already past the decade average just in, in Alberta. And British Columbia has seen a number of fires and also seen a, a lot of flooding and just some severe weather as well. What's also interesting is the magnitude and the frequency of these claims. So in this past decade, we've had 91 insurance catastrophes. And a catastrophe is designed or named as a single event costing more than $25 million in insured damage. That's called a catastrophe in, in the insurance terms. We've had 91 of those in the past decade. The decade before, we had 47, so almost half of that amount in, in the previous decades. So just a lot more of these events. And we've also had some of the costliest events in our nation's history have happened this past decade. The number one and the biggest event being the Fort McMurray wildfire in 2016. In 2013, there was severe flooding in Alberta. And this year, the number four of the costliest was a great big hailstorm that happened in, in central Alberta and went off into Saskatchewan as well. So there's just a lot of severe weather that we're seeing. 
we're also seeing lower interest rates. So while the interest rates may be great for your mortgage or for getting a loan, they have an impact for the return on equity and the return on investments. So in 2018, the insurance industry saw the lowest return on equity that it's seen in about 16 years. And certainly over this past decade is lower returns than the industry would historically see on average. So that really has an impact on the amount of capital that the industry has to deploy to cover the costs of these claims. And of course, we've had the pandemic. Now, some of these challenges were happening before the pandemic set in, but the pandemic has just exacerbated the situation. The economy is impacted. Your businesses are directly impacted by the downturn in the economy. You, I'm sure, have less people that are staying at your hotels, and there's a lot more restrictions on your establishments as well, your bars and hotels and, and the hospitality industry. To get a broader understanding of the challenging market conditions, about a month ago, we commissioned Deloitte to create a report called the State of the Canadian Commercial Property Casualty and Insurance Marketplace. And really it concluded that there's many factors that are affecting the availability and the affordability of the insurance industry. So a number of these events, like I mentioned, were just a rise in the extreme weather events, more claims, the COVID pandemic has exacerbated this situation. There's been an overall decline in the investment income. And there's also some macroeconomic conditions that are going on. These are things like the interest rates, where a provincial government or even the federal government doesn't have control over a lot of those interest rates. And there's also a lot of these bigger events that are happening around the world that are impacting the reinsurance market. So an insurance company purchases reinsurance for these big catastrophic events. And these are global companies that insure the events like the California wildfires, the hurricane on the Eastern seaboard, the flooding that happened in China and Europe and earthquakes around the world. And because of those events, that actually impacts the cost for the domestic insurers for them to purchase reinsurance. So the company's direct costs are also changing as well by these reinsurance markets. Now, what this report also indicated, and a copy of this report is publicly available, we'll get to that in a moment, but it also indicated that these, that Deloitte is expecting these economic impacts on the insurance market will continue on for about another year. And we're going to start to see some changes in about 2022. So really what that means is we're going to be experiencing some challenging conditions for a while, which is not good news for anyone, uh, particularly in in the hospitality industry because some of the things that are going on with the pandemic are just very, very challenging. Different markets of the commercial insurance industry are performing differently, as you can imagine. So there are some jurisdictions that may not have as many claims and there's other like Alberta, as you heard, had very significant severe weather this year and even in the past several years. BC has not been immune. BC has had some very challenging situations with some historic flooding in the Grand Forks area in 2018, the wildfires and just many other events that have impacted different regions around the province. The challenging market conditions, as I mentioned, they did start before the pandemic hit. We started to notice them in about late 2019. But the pandemic is just exacerbating and amplifying these issues that are going on in the market. Many businesses are shut down. So as they shut down, they would cancel their insurance policy. And that also impacts the insurer's capital because they would have to return that premium because it's not earned yet. So they would be reducing whatever portion of that premium would not be used. So that would ultimately have an impact on their overall capital as well. So these do have an effect on all the businesses, including the insurance industry. Now, one good thing that has happened particularly is with a pandemic, most business insurance policies don't cover pandemic losses. So whether that's business interruption or if a person gets and catches COVID while at your facility. But there is something called liability immunity. So there's a number of uncertainties that businesses face as they 
open and you're recovering from the pandemic. So some of this legislation can support the consumer protections and supports the businesses with your recovery efforts, as long as you're following the government protocols. Now, British Columbia, they have implemented those reforms to have the liability immunity apply to general businesses, in addition to the essential services and other areas like the amateur sports sector. We're seeing that in Ontario and New Brunswick, but there's several other provinces that have not adopted that. So there are significant risks for the insurance industry in these other provinces for those potential exposures for people catching COVID and then ultimately they would be suing your businesses. If your policy does not cover that, your policy may still owe a defense. So they would have to at least start that process to do some of the investigations, see if the policy responds. And those are just expenses that companies would be incurring as we start to see some of these events unfold. BC is a little bit different because of the legislation and, and we certainly applaud the provincial government for taking those steps and those measures. I'd like to turn it over to Darius now to walk us through the next few slides. Thank you, Rob. Um, you know, I, I thought I'd first just start with uh, what is a risk manager? And I, and I think there is a little bit of uncertainty. Um, the word gets bantied about and is, is the risk manager the insurance broker? Do you, uh, do you work for an insurer? Is there some other um, job that you do? So in my career, actually, I, I started off as an insurance adjuster. So the person that ends up giving you the money, if you have a car accident, or in my case, I looked after uh, the big semi trucks. Um, I also worked as a commercial underwriter. So the person behind the scenes that you don't really get to see that takes a look at the risk itself, uh, benchmarks it against uh, other similar risks and kind of, kind of determines, okay, is this the best in class risk or is this a risk that's, that has a high hazard category? So higher ha hazard category equals higher premiums uh, best in class equals lower premiums. Um, I also worked as a commercial insurance broker. Um, so the people that you deal with right now with, uh, with your insurance programs. Um, and I've also been and am the risk manager for different organizations, everything from uh, the Calgary Board of Education, who has a very uh, large insurance portfolio, uh, to Mount Royal University and the AVP for risk management there. I've actually been the client's representative so working for the benefit of the client, like uh, Mount Royal University, and going out into the marketplace and trying to find the best terms and conditions for, for our risks when we're looking out into the marketplace for insurance. So what that gives me uh, working with IBC is, is an eye that comes from a different source. Um, actually, it's the same place that it comes from uh, many of the owners here, where you're wondering, okay, what's the best course for me? Well, before I know the best course, I need to understand a little bit more about the actual um, environment that we're in. And Rob laid out very well the environment that we're in. We're in a hard market. Um, and what do you do in a hard market? Do you just shop your uh, business around even more? Uh, do you manage your risk better? Uh, what are your options? And you know, this is one thing I want to talk about and kind of uh, lay out the environment. For, for me, just like in real estate, we're location, location, location. Is, is the key to real estate. Uh, capacity, capacity, capacity is the key to lower uh, insurance premiums. When, when insurers make money, more insurers come into the marketplace and go, you know what, we wanna be part of that same pie. When insurers start losing money on, on their business, and like Rob said, you know, through uh, catastrophes, um, ever increasing uh, social inflation or judicial inflation, you know, they have a harder time earning a profit on it. And as they don't earn a profit, some insurers then say, you know what, we don't want to write that type of business anymore. So one of the keys is to actually find capacity in the marketplace, someone that wants to do that type of business. And that really does help. Historically, the insurance industry is, is mostly in a soft market. Uh, I've been around long enough to see that there's been some spikes uh, over the last 20 years, twice. Um, and it's very hard as a market. And in between 2001 and uh, 2019, it's a big trough. And what we see is a very soft market, very cheap rates. But you know, insurers were making money and we're, we had fewer uh, catastrophes on the horizon. 
So there weren't these surprises that we're seeing right now. So the less surprises we have, the, the better the, the terms for the insurance contract, the more surprises. And I hate to tell you, I'm, I'm in Calgary. So that, that hailstorm is all my fault. So $1.2 billion spent. I saw the impact of that. I've seen the cars dented to an unbelievable amount of damage. And I've seen the uh, exteriors of the homes. It looked like it was in a war zone, but it was a hailstorm. Right, so that makes a huge impact. And just in a 15 minute span of time, $1.2 billion was spent on effectively one claim type. That impacts capacity, right? That money does get paid. And the Canadian insurance industry is actually one of the best uh, industries in all of the world for making sure when claims happen, insurers pay. And I, I rely on that as a risk manager because my own clients rely on that. And as a result, I want to make sure that something big happens, there's money in the bank. But how do they keep the money in the bank? And that's kind of where we're going with this because regulators get to decide how much money you need in the bank. And they do say, you know what, we need you to be well funded. Okay, we're well funded. But to keep that, they, they still need to have enough premium coming in to actually fund it. Um, and Rob talked about reinsurers, and reinsurers are really you know, global insurance companies. Uh, they have a lot of experience, but they play in the entire world, not just in Canada. And you can imagine in Canada, you know, we have about 38 million people or so, and uh, the US is about 10 times bigger than us, and there's many other countries that are even bigger. So reinsurers drive a lot of the, uh, the rating model for insurance and capacity, because insurance companies actually buy insurance. Um, and, it, and it's a model that works to make sure there's always money uh, available to pay for claims. Rob, can we go to the next one? So business interruption insurance, and, and we saw this as an example uh, the last number of months with the onset of COVID um, and how it works. And I, I've been um, around long enough to see the benefit of business interruption insurance for many different businesses. And a lot of, uh, a lot of my clients are, have either experienced a fire or uh, had a fire as I was the, uh, the risk manager. And one of the best forms of coverage for the business is business interruption coverage. Um, it, it's critical to surviving because during that period of time when you're out of business for a number of months, uh, you need some sort of cash flow still to continue going after you get back into business. Um, but you need to pay uh, premium for business interruption coverage. Uh, and it's specifically insured for uh, events that are insured by your property insurance policy. And, and I think sometimes um, uh, some of the broad coverage that's available kind of confuses the, the business interruption coverage that's available. Uh, and I, I think that may have happened with some of the COVID uh, thoughts that came out. Well, my business was stopped, right? Because of a, uh, a governmental order, but actually nothing physically happened to my business. My business didn't burn down. My business wasn't inundated with a flood. Um, so there's a, a little bit of a disconnect there. And, and I understand the disconnect. Uh, business interruption coverage is, is critical for businesses, uh, but COVID wasn't one of those things that they considered um, as, as they design the business interruption insurance policy. And you can ima imagine they design it in such a way to make sure it covers lots of your risks, but at the same time that they charge enough to pay for all those claims that come in. And the, the two have to go hand in hand. Um, otherwise there's, there's further problems. Rob, can you go to the next? Thank you. So, so you're, uh, you're paying premium for business interruption losses. Um, and as the, the slide talks, you pay on a monthly basis or you pay once a year for that coverage. Uh, the biggest thing that I've seen with business interruption uh, coverage is uh, limits aren't adequate for what you're actually doing within your business. And, and it comes in, in two parts. One, as a business grows, what I see is that business interruption limits of insurance don't grow with the business. 
and, and it's critical that it grows with as you as you grow. So if you're doing a million dollars with a business one year and you grow to 1.5, it has an impact on your insurance premium because you need to actually change your limit of insurance to match your new growing business. The same is true for when we go into a slump. So business interruption limits are actually uh, adjustable or in many cases they're adjustable. So what I tell my clients is, well, if, you, if your business is down on, uh, on business, last year was at a million dollars and you forecast a half a million for this year, well, you, you go back and say, you know what, I need to adjust my business interruption limit for my most current year because my premium will go down and uh, you, you basically ask for a refund from the insurance company. So that's one way of actually trying to get a little bit of relief for your insurance premiums by closely monitoring how much revenue you have, talking with your insurance broker and saying, okay, well, actually my uh, projected is at this, uh, they'll wait and say, okay, what's your actual for your fiscal year end? And then they'll report it to the insurers and you can get a return premium. And at this point in time, that's an important uh, tactic that uh, the hospitality industry needs to use. Rob, can you change? So I've gotten lots of questions with regards to COVID and uh, Will business interruption pay for COVID-19 claims and why doesn't it? Um, and, and for me as a risk manager, I, I look at COVID like I look at uh, war risk. Um, it, we we call, kind of all know in our bones that, you know, if a war broke out in Canada or wherever we are, um, insurers don't have the ability, no insurers do anywhere in the world, to, uh, to pay for the loss of buildings, uh, people, contents, as a result of a war risk, right? So if war breaks out somewhere, the amount of damage that happens is just catastrophic all, all over the place. And you know, whether you're talking World War I, World War II in Iraq or wherever you are. So, so we know already that war risk is something that we understand won't be insured. It's just too large, too grand of a scale for there to be coverage for it. You know, the same thing actually holds true for uh, nuclear contamination. It's currently something that's excluded under your insurance. We, we never test it because, you know what, it's, it's already excluded. We haven't had a big uh, nuclear event in Canada. Although in the U.S. there have been certain events. Uh, my, my, my mind goes to Three Mile Island, which is probably the most uh, known. Um, so these things do happen, but that contamination wouldn't have been insured in the U.S. There's other coverages that are actually excluded also. Um, but now with a more mature insurance market, what we find is you can buy it back. So in BC, earthquake normally is excluded. And what you end up doing is you buy it back. You pay an additional premium to buy the, the peril of earthquake. And you know, if you're downtown Vancouver, right, along the coast, really a good idea to actually buy that coverage back. You know, the same goes for flood. You know, when you're near a uh, floodway, uh, I'm sure your businesses, if you're near a floodway, you're going, well, you know what, I do want to get flood coverage. And, and the interesting thing about flood and no flood is those that need it, buy it. Those that don't need it, don't buy it. So they don't contribute to the spread of risk. They don't contribute to the premiums of the many paying the losses of the few. In, in floods, really, the pre people that are exposed to flooding buy flooding coverage. And what we find is that usually the premiums are quite high because only the people exposed to that risk will buy it. So there's fewer people buying the insurance. Uh, terrorism is, is another example of uh, it's excluded. Uh, you know, we have the example down in the US in 2001, um, but now you can actually buy it back. I, I used to work for a big uh, real estate firm. Um, after the events of 9-11, uh, we had to do some critical analysis because we have to think, you know, do we want to buy terrorism coverage for some of our key properties, right? Properties that would be at risk um, just because of their size, who was in there or what have you. Um, and it was expensive, but we had to make those decisions uh, because it's not included, but you buy it back. I would say the same thing applies for COVID-19, right? It was, it was similar to a war risk exclusion in the past. Can you imagine if everyone put forward a claim for COVID there would no longer be an insurance industry. 
Um, there, there's actually been some uh, calculations done uh, based on the, uh, uh, the claims that have, that have gone forward. That's actually more than all the capital that the uh, insurance companies in Canada have, right? So that would actually be, in effect, a catastrophe. Um, what I think will probably happen, although I'm not sure, um, I, I can look into my crystal ball, is, is in the future, there'll be some insurer in you know, two or three years that says, you know what, I think there's an opportunity to sell uh, pandemic coverage, and this is what it's going to look like. And just like they did with earthquake coverage or flood coverage or terrorism coverage. So they'll offer up the coverage and you can choose to buy it or not buy it. Rob, can we go to the next? So supporting businesses. Um, myself and uh, the entire team at IBC, uh, we're, we're looking at supporting businesses just like yours. Uh, and we've started that with uh, the, I'll, I'll call it a test case. I, I'm thinking Rob's sick. Well, don't call it a test case. But on, Ontario, we're, we're helping hospitality uh, uh, businesses in Ontario, uh, operating in Ontario, to actually uh, get the coverage that they sorely need uh, within a very hard market. And you know, some of it is uh, rates are really sky high. Um, some risks are actually risks that have had very large losses to them. I, I think we for, forget sometimes that, um, you know, when we have no losses, like no losses in the last five years, and we have an increase, it's like, well, it's unjustified, where we, we've, we're up 20 or 30%. Um, but those that have had many losses, and I've seen this uh, in BC, I'll get to that in a moment, um, you know, we, we can actually manage how we uh, manage our claims and uh, try and avoid claims to then, in fact, uh, uh, in effect, uh, reduce our insurance premiums. So uh, IBC and myself, um, I'm working with many clients in, uh, in the strata business and also in Ontario for hospitality, looking for different ways, everything from managing risk better, um, uh, could, uh, coming up with risk mitigation strategies for some of the hospitality risks. Uh, I think some risks you know, make really good money when business is good. But sometimes they forget that you know if you carve out one small expense here that maybe adds to the bottom line, it ends up coming back a little bit later and it kind of hurts you maybe one or two years down the road. So kind of figuring out you know should you cut that expense or should you uh, keep it because it's a good way of controlling your risks. It, for example, you know, let's say uh, a bouncer in a bar, right? You want the bouncer in the bar in probably more than one. Right, because the cost of that bouncer really does save you uh, uh, lots of money in the future uh, and also saves your reputation immediately. Rob, can you switch? So um, IBC has launched a national task force on commercial insurance. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, included in that is, uh, is a risk manager, myself. To, to work with commercial clients. But you know, part of my job isn't just to work with commercial clients, but it, that is the core focus of mine. But it's also come up with what's going on in the marketplace, uh, what's happening with those clients. And for example, in BC with the Stratas, um, I've been doing this uh, for a number of months now. And you know, as we got information coming in from the marketplace, I was actually able to um, report on that. I, I have a monthly report that I bring into IBC and just what's happening in the market, right? What are the opportunities for change? How can IBC with uh, insurers, with government, with the Insurance Brokers Association, with the regulator, um, make some positive changes in the marketplace that will truly uh, reduce the cost of doing business for consumers? And, and that's critical, right? And so are there ways of actually doing that through regulation? Uh, BC is doing it right now. They're, uh, uh, they've already enacted some pieces and they're looking to enact another piece effective January 1st. Right, you know, and it's a good idea that uh, we work together and figure out solutions. And, you know, I think some people say capping insurance premiums is a solution, uh, but I've, I've seen that uh, tried in different jurisdictions and there's, there's always a secondary impact that you don't anticipate. And those impacts are sometimes even worse than uh, what you're wishing for. 
So, you know, part of this is making sure that we can communicate back and forth and figure out what's going on. And it's the same thing in Ontario as I'm working with the uh, business insurance action team. You know, as we talk to all these insureds, we figure out, you know what, I think there's another course of action that we can do that, that helps them out. Rob, one more slide. Um, so uh, the business insurance action team, or BIOT for short, for short uh, has already launched in, in November uh, and it's focusing on, in Ontario at the moment. Um, you know, like, like anything else, we're, we're trying to figure out where it works well and where it doesn't work well. Uh, we're improving on it every day. And I think as it improves, we'll have a better handle on what consumers need what the core issue is with some of the uh, some of the problems, and you know some of the problems that I've seen on the very first files that have come up, um, a little bit of a lack of communication um, within an, within an insurer themselves. So once that lack of communication was solved, we realized there was a very easy solution because that insurer was still actually in the marketplace doing hospitality risks. So you know we're working continuously with all the groups to make sure there's a good outcome for everyone. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as poor communication or incomplete communication. I, I wanna talk a little bit about insurance programs. And uh, as a broker in the past, uh, I've been part of uh, and developed a condominium uh, program when I was a broker in Alberta. And we also actually did the uh, DQ uh, restaurant program. Uh, and later on, it actually expanded. Um, you know, the DQ program was a very interesting one for me. Uh, we were very competitive. And we were competitive because at the very beginning, uh, we took a look at all the DQs that were out there. And we got all the best DQs, all the biggest uh, operators, operators with a lot of funding, a lot of administration, a lot of well uh, risk managed locations. And as a result, uh, the program did really well and our rates were just awesome. They were down by about 30% compared to industry standard rates for a, a kind of a Dairy Queen uh, operation. Think of Burger King, Dairy Queen, McDonald's, that sort of stuff. Um, and as we grew, we actually had issues with that program because uh, now we had other operators getting into the program and realizing, oh, you know, this insurance is really cheap. You know, it's such cheap insurance. You know what I'll do? I can have a claim or two and, you know, small claims that probably most of us wouldn't have put forward, but I'm going to put it through anyway, because what's going to happen? My uh, $2,000 premium will go up by 20%. And it's like, well, yeah, but I can put through a $5,000 claim and oh, I'm ahead of the game in the immediate future. So we, we had a lot of these issues come up with that program. And, you know, as the programs get bigger and bigger, um, we didn't have all the best in class Dairy Queens. And as a result, we saw the premiums going up and we saw problems within our insurer group saying, you know, this started off as a really, you know, good program, inexpensive rates for the DQs. Now they're, they're having quite a few premium, uh, quite a few losses. One of the big losses back then, and I guess it probably shows a little bit of my, of my age, because this was back when cash was still king is uh, uh, theft from the uh, from the DQ, theft from the safe, theft from the uh, cash registers, theft from the manager's office because they didn't put the uh, deposit bag into the bank. Um, you know, so there's a lot of pieces that actually um, hinder a program's success. Um, you know, and you know, good businesses actually help a program success, but when risk management takes a back seat. Um, and small claims get submitted here, there, maybe a couple times a year, because I, I've seen people using the insurance programs a little bit like a savings account. If I, you know, put in ten thousand dollars every year, I expect to take five thousand out. Um, over the long run, when more and more people do that same action, the insurance program will collapse because it just can't support that kind of weight of claims. Because for every small five thousand dollar claim, there, there's going to be a large claim. You know, a claim that takes up a lot of the money that everyone put in. So a million dollar fire or a million dollar host liquor liability uh, lawsuit. 
right? Uh, an allegation of over serving summers and someone gets injured. Um, and those things cost a lot of money. Lawyers are, are expensive for defense. Uh, and if anyone gets injured, it's expensive to uh, compensate them for the injury. So there's a lot of forces at work here. Um, but, you know, um, the, the hospitality association and the program, there's lots of things that each of us can do to just try and, you know, get 1% better every year, right? And then reduce the frequency uh, and reduce the severity of our claims. Good risk management is one of those pieces. So, uh, and that's the major piece that I work with, with all the groups is coming up with different ideas that work for managing risk within the, the hospitality group or within stratas and, and some other business types. Um, so hopefully with enough of that work being done, we can collectively work and reduce uh, the claims counts, the claim severities. And with that also you know, re reduce the premiums that we pay. Rob, one more. Thank you. So I, I think I've talked about this before and I just wanted to give a couple real world examples. Um, because actually they just speak more than anything else, don't they? Um, so a couple of stratas uh, within BC, um, and not just a couple, but you know many of them. I, I see this frequency and in a strata, we're, we're talking a $30 million building, right? So not some you know, uh, uh, small business, we're talking impacting a hundred different unit owners, uh, nice places. And you know, there's a disconnect between well, do we actually want to put this claim through or not? And sometimes they just go the easy route and say, well, you know, unit 4B, uh, the toilet overflowed, right? And we need to clean it up. Well, you know what? Instead of having our own maintenance people cl uh, clean it up or our own restoration firm, let's put in an insurance claim. You know, no big deal. We'll pay the deductible, whatever it is, and then uh, we'll do it. Well, you know what? It's an easy way of actually not putting much effort into uh, managing the claim. Right? It really is. Insurance companies are really good at responding to your claim, sending someone out, getting a race restoration firm to come in. You know, easy, right? It's easy. For anything that's too easy, there, there's always that extra cost associated with it. You know, so one small claim doesn't actually uh, tip, over, tip over the apple cart. But, you know, these same uh, stratas, I've actually seen three or four. And when I've talked to the board, I've asked them, okay, why did you guys put through that claim? You know what, we didn't know that we had put through that claim. You know, the uh, unit owner maybe put through that claim, right? Or, you know, someone else within the office put that claim through and they were to wear. So I, I've always asked them, you know, go to your insurance broker and figure out what claims you have. Each insurance broker is able to do that. They can itemize all the claims and they can say, okay, over the last period of five years that you've been with us, you know, uh, the insurers have paid out $50,000 in claims, um, $7,000 in expenses, uh, and this is what it looks like. Oh, okay, well, thank you very much. I actually have a better view on what's going on. And, you know, as I talk to Stratas, more and more of them are informing themselves and saying, you know what, I can manage this better. And, and some of the issues for Stratas are as simple as uh, water monitoring devices on uh, water systems, uh, you know, dishwashers break, or dishwasher hoses break usually, you know, the old uh, black uh, uh, rubber hoses that just dry out in time. Um, toilets just leak. So just even the water cost of that leaking toilet can add hundreds or thousands of dollars to a strata uh, utility bill, right? So as we think about these things more often, I'm finding that risk control is, is the key to actually managing um, your own entity and trying to get to best in class. Right? The higher up you are in managing your own business with fewer claims and fewer, uh, uh, fewer issues, actually, the better your reputation is within your consumers, you're always open, you're always operating, and your insurance premiums then follow over time. Rob, back to you. Thank you, Darius. As I mentioned before, we're also working with governments. The provincial government in BC introduced liability immunity, which is a great step dealing with the pandemic. But what we're also looking for is just some land use planning. And this typically falls with the municipal government. So a lot of 
these properties are being built in harm's way. So they're being built in earthquake zones or flood hazard areas. And if we amended those land use planning, then we could really help prevent some of these losses from occurring. And even strengthening the building codes. Darius just mentioned about the water loss. And as we say in insurance, water is the new fire, meaning we're seeing a significant increase in a lot of these water claims across the country whether it's from flooding or whether it's in some of these stratas for toilet leaks or dishwasher leaks, they are having a significant impact. So strengthening the building codes can actually prevent some of these. We're also working on education and training. And part of the training and education is having you here today to understand some of the circumstances that are going on. And, and recently we're working with the federal government. They launched a national action plan on flooding and a task force to help address some of those properties that are in flood hazard areas that need that protection, but may not be able to get that at an affordable price. So we're certainly working with them on that portion as well. There he is. There is your own mute. Um, Rob, we have, uh, I'm just looking at the time. We have about 10 minutes and I, um, we just have a question here in, um, a couple of questions actually in this, uh, in the chat. Uh, and here is one. So everything sounds great to explain the woes of the insurance industry, but when my, ins but when my business revenues are down, I cannot pass along these costs to my guests. This is my worst year in business. And now I just got my insurance renewal with over 175% increase in my premiums. I have a robust risk management strategy. How do I pay my premium? Increase my rates by 175%. If I did, what little business I would have would disappear. Extremely challenging and difficult times for the hotels in, in BC, the hospitality industry in general, without a doubt. One of the factors that we're seeing here and, and one piece that Darius mentioned is just working with your insurance representative. Insurance is a significant cost that you have and working with that representative who understands your business and taking a close look at your overall costs. Many of your costs are based on your revenue. So if your revenue has decreased substantially, maybe you look, need to look at your limits of your insurance and that could be correspondingly decreasing as well. And that could be a savings. Also reviewing all of your coverage to make sure that you know your coverage and to understand what coverage you have. And maybe there's some coverage that you have that you may need. You can also be increasing your deductible. So increasing that deductible could help lower those premiums. We do have an insurance website and I've left up the, the screen here just to remind people that our website is businessinsurancehelp.ca. So it has a number of tools and resources that are available for businesses and also a, a phone number. It's a commercial helpline. So if you have a business and want to talk one-on-one -on -one about your specific circumstances and, and just to get an independent opinion, the phone number is up on the screen at one 844 to ask IBC. And we do have very experienced insurance professionals that can help walk you through some of those steps and provide you with some other options. Thank you for that, Rob. Here's another question. Is there a timeline on the National Action Flood Plan? And another, or you can answer that one and then I have another one following that. Sure, the National Action Plan on Flood is something IBC initiated a couple of years ago. We've been working with the federal government pretty closely to try to establish that and develop the financing for that particular uh, risk financing portion of the, the pool. The federal government recently announced a task force to tackle this and, and take that on. So their mandate is going to be set up and their objectives set up early in the new year. And we're hoping that we're gonna really start to see some tangible action over the next year or so while this task force gets up and running. In the meantime, we're certainly working on a number of other factors with both the provincial and municipal governments to understand what's happening and also to be encouraging the governments to be investing in infrastructure where it makes sense 
and also consider strategic retreats or some of these buyouts in some of these really high flood prone areas where it make, may make more sense for this strategic retreat than investing in the infrastructure. So we're working on it on a number of fronts. How do insurance premiums uh, compare nationally uh, across the country? Are British Columbia premiums similar to other provinces in Canada? Or is the challenge with our insurance rates in BC specific to BC? The challenges are across the country that we're seeing. Many of these are global challenges. The actual rates are very specific to individual policies, the type of coverage you have. A lot of it is tied for the property side to the replacement cost of your property. So as you can imagine, a replacement cost on a $100 million strata versus a $4 million small business, the rates may be similar, but the dollar amounts paid are very, very different because it's based on a certain rate per hundred dollars or per thousand dollars of coverage. So difficult question to answer without knowing a bit more specifics and a bit more details. We do know that BC has had a lot of severe weather and a lot of claims. We do know that something called a claims ratio. So in the strata market, the regulator looked into this recently and for every hundred dollars that was being taken in for premiums in the strata market, $100 or more was being paid out in claims and expenses by the insurance industry. So that means it's more than 100% of this combined ratio. And, and those are really difficult times. And we see other sectors that do have more than 100% ratio as well. Those numbers differ across the country, but we are seeing a lot of challenges across the country. And that Deloitte report that I mentioned earlier, a copy of that report can be found on business insurance help .ca, and that'll provide a bit more of a national overview on, on some of the challenges that businesses are facing across the country. Thank you, Rob. Here's one more question. Can you cover the COVID-19 risks to the insurer and the property's owners in a bit more detail? Is it okay for property owners to take COVID-19 affected clients into our properties? What is the impact to our insurance? Insurers are asking contagious disease exclusion endorsement to our policies. Is this allowed? And what is the impact to the property owner? So businesses like hotels, they're quite unique where they would potentially be accepting people who may have COVID. There's a number of testing facilities that are utilizing different facilities to, to test people or potentially to house them. This is where the BC government stepped up and provided that liability immunity. So essentially, if the liability for your particular business could be impacted by COVID related, as long as you're following the provincial guidelines, that does provide some liability to you. Because typically insurance policies do not cover pandemic related losses. They typically have some type of communicable disease exclusions built into the policy. So if a person did contract COVID while at your facility, your policy would likely not respond. That's a common exclusion with commercial policies. But the liability immunity in, in BC has really stepped up. And I'll maybe turn to Darius to see if he has any additional comments on that. You're on mute, Darius. There you go. There we go. No, I guess this time I still have the mute on. Um, you know, I, I spoke to the, uh, the contagious uh, disease exclusion or, uh, you know, the, the coverage for terrorism, earthquake, flood. Um, you know, the, these are all things that weren't anticipated to be on an insurance policy. Um, you know, in my line of work, I look at all the things that are anticipated to be insured and I make sure that my risks match up with those, uh, what's, a, what's being offered. Uh, what I also do is for those pieces of, of risk that aren't insured, I come up with more ro robust plans to make sure I'm not exposed to them. So it, it, insurance insures for quite a bit, but it doesn't insure for everything. And I, and I think sometimes we look to insurance policies to just kind of be that panacea that it's going to cover off anything and everything that I'm ever exposed to. 
And, and that's just not the case. It's just too complex of a world. And whether you know it or not, there's already things that aren't included that you're probably susceptible to. So, you know, for an example, uh, I, I worked for a firm called uh, Tonko Realty, uh, also called Trailvest. And at a certain period of time, um, I believe it was during H1N1, uh, we had a very real conversation of what are we going to do with H1N1, right? The early version of this whole pandemic when these, these guests are coming into our commercial buildings, right? What if they come in and then there's allegations against us for not keeping a, a clean and safe building? We were one of the very first that, if you remember back in those days, we put hand sanitizers everywhere, everywhere within the building, right? So you see it on the, uh, the, the buttons right beside, right beside the buttons for the elevator. You saw it as you came in, a big, screen, a big sign saying, you know, this is what our strategy is for trying to lessen the impact of H1N1, right? Today, we actually, that's just a common uh, strategy. But back in the day, we never did that. So you know, we started off, you know, uh, putting out hand sanitizer stations, washing down uh, our buildings better, you know, engaging our janitorial, right? We, like anyone else in real estate, you know, the pennies are tight. But at a certain, certain time, you say, you know what, I'm going to let loose the, uh, the purse strings. I want to make sure it's a nice, clean environment. And we've seen examples of environments that aren't clean. Uh, the Norwalk virus, uh, the issues that happened on many of the cruise ships of late. You know, and you just have to think back to a couple different examples and you go, okay, what would I have done had I been in that situation? And it's not rely on the insurance company to do something. It's actually think about how you're going to manage that risk. Um, I, I personally like the whole idea of doing a little scan check to see, of course, infrared, uh, the temperature of your guests, right? I think lots of guests are very open and honest. Some guests don't know they're running a fever, right? And as you allow them into the premises, you're running the risk with your business, but you're also then running the reputational risk. And that reputational risk is not insured anywhere within an insurance policy. So, you know, work hard to protect your reputation with good risk management and the good things will happen with that. But the insurance industry doesn't protect you against all the different things that could happen. Darius, thank you so much. And, and Rob, um, you know, we've, um, you know, we've been working for many months with our partners, uh, you know, federally and provincially on these insurance issues. And, you know, the pain of, of crippling premiums is being felt all over the province. And that's for hotels, motels, stratas, you know, we've, we have stepped up as an industry to provide safe shelter. We've worked hand in hand with government and the Minister of Health, and we continue to do everything we can to ensure that our public and our guests and our employees are safe. The challenge, of course, is that when we get this kind of uh, increases, increased costs with severely reduced revenues, it is a real pain point, and I can tell you, this is one of the biggest issues currently facing our industry. And so we really appreciate, A, your willingness to partner and educate uh, with the BC Hotel Association and directly with our industry. And we also really appreciate that you've provided uh, your contact information and phone number. And I know that we've had many hotels that have been able to reach out when they have questions about their own policy for renewal. Um, so I just like to thank you with an eye on the time. Uh, it's now one minute after the top of the hour. So I just want to thank you both very, very much. And just let everybody know that is on the call today that this will, it has been recorded and it will be sent out in a communique. You're welcome to share it. If you have any additional questions, please reach out uh, to us at BCHA. And that's either CEO at bcha.com or membership at bcha.com. And we'll continue to work together towards potentially developing some kind of a strategy so we don't have a, a you know, a, a, a repeat of this terrible situation. So thank you very much today. And thank you very much, Ingrid. And I agree with you that you are a great partner. And it is the work of the BC Hotels Association that is working for their members, trying to help this situation. It's not an easy fix, 
but certainly working together, we have a lot better chance of improving this situation over the long term. So thank you and, and everyone at your organization, Ingrid. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid.